one second and I will bring up a shared file and we're gonna go over the contracts for today. Just be one second. And here we go. Get us going. All right, we should be ready to go. So we're starting with the exclusive right to sell listing contract. We're going to be going over all the contracts. I'm going to go over them in detail here in a series so that you can see each contract. And then when we meet together on a Zoom, you'll have this to refer back to. When we meet together, I'll be giving you the general outlay of what contracts do, how they work, what they're about. This video, I'm going to try to give you a more detailed view, especially what would be over or tested on the test. So this is an exclusive right to sell listing contract. You probably remember it um, from when we did exclusive right to list in our yellow book. This is the one we use in Colorado. It's going to seem very similar. But when an agent has someone who wants to sell a house, this is the form we use. We go to the house, we go over this form with the seller. We start by explaining to them, this is our exclusive right to sell. Remember an exclusive right to sell means that I can sell the house only, nobody else can sell the house, not even the homeowner themselves. Only the agent can sell the house. So we're gonna start, we have to make a selection, whether we're gonna be a seller agency or a transaction brokerage, which one are we gonna do? I'm gonna select seller agency on mine because I like to start as a seller agent. The next thing coming up here is, are we a multi-person firm? We have to tell the seller, oops, excuse me, I'm gonna go back up the top, the date here is today's date. Then the multi-person firm, I need to tell you that I belong to a multi-member brokerage firm. The reason that's important is I work for Keller Williams. We have 100 plus agents. It's possible that one of our other agents could show up with a buyer. And if they do, they will still represent their buyer. I will represent you as a seller. If for some reason I bring the buyer, I'll change to a transaction broker. The terms are seller. We need the name of the seller. Brokerage firm. My firm is Keller Williams First Realty. This is my wife's name, Donna. We're going to talk about their property. We need a legal description, just as we did in the yellow book. We need a, a legal description. So we're in the county of my house, would be Larimer. And it's Berthed Commons, Lot 10, Block 4. Also known as, this is my address with my zip code. You'll see there's a box to check. If, this, if my home is part of a affordable housing subdivision, I need to tell my realtor. In my case, it is not. The next part we get to is sale or lease. So if this box is checked, seller authorizes broker to negotiate a lease. They won't be on the test, so I'm not going to do that. We're going to just go with a straight sale, with no leasing going on here. On line 47, you'll see the listing period. It begins on because we can write this listing agreement to start and stop on any particular date and time. If I were visiting with you tonight to sell your house, and you didn't want to put it on the market for a week, well, then I would start it a week from today. And then it's going to ask how long it goes. Now, in Colorado, it cannot go more than a year. You must have a beginning and end date. It cannot go more than a year. So in this case, I might put six months or three months just up to the agent. It won't be a testable item. As you scroll down, we come to brokerage relationships. So again, you're the seller, I'm your agent. I need to go over my brokerage relationships with you. 
There are 11 questions on the Colorado test over brokerage relationships. Most of it can be found right here inside the contracts. We started by saying if seller agency in box one is checked, broker represents seller as your agent. If the transaction brokerage box is checked, broker only acts as a transaction broker. I will be acting completely as a seller's agent for you. In company transaction, different brokers, in the event someone else from my brokerage firm were to bring the buyer, that would be called an in-company transaction with different brokers. I would still be your seller's agent. The other agent would represent the buyer. Therefore, it's allowed, not a problem. Seller's agent. So we're going to say I did check that. I represent you as a seller. I will either treat the buyer as I will treat the buyer as a customer. A customer is a party of the transaction with whom I have no relationship. I will not disclose things to a customer. However, I will be honest and treat them fairly. This box, seller agency only. If I check that box and I bring the buyer, I am not allowed to become a transaction broker. Therefore, I may not bring the buyer. I wouldn't check that box. Transaction broker gives them an idea what that is. Here's the brokerage duties. Every broker is obligated to perform these duties. Perform the terms of any written or oral agreement with the seller. I must present to you all offers to and from in a timely manner, regardless of whether the property is subject to a contract for sale. The interesting part of that is regardless of whether it's subject to a contract for sale. So if we accepted a contract and we are under contract and I receive another offer, I am obligated to share that offer with you even though we are under contract. Does not matter. I cannot keep information from you and I must show you every offer received. So I'll present all offers to and from seller in a timely manner. Disclose to seller adverse material facts known by the broker. It's one of the reasons when you look at a house, you may know some adverse material facts about the house that maybe even the person living there doesn't know. Perhaps they don't know it was built on a dump yard. We had some homes that were new builds that had some floor joists put in that had formaldehyde on them. I happen to know that subdivision. I know where it's at. It's possible that I would know it and the seller themselves wouldn't know it. So I will tell them any adverse material fact I know. Advising seller regarding the transaction and advising seller to obtain expert advice as to material matters about which the broker knows, but the specifics of which are beyond the scope of the broker expertise. So suppose I look at your house and I see a crack and I'm pretty sure that is indication of a foundation issue. That's beyond my expertise. Nonetheless, I would tell you about it and I would advise you to have a contractor who is experienced at that come out and give you advice as to what to do with that. If I receive any money from you, I must account in a timely manner for it. I must keep you fully informed throughout the transaction. I must never disclose the following information without the informed consent of the seller. Test question. I will never tell anyone that you will accept less than the asking price. I will never tell anyone why you want to sell your house. What's your motivation? I'm not going to tell them you'll agree to any other terms, financing or otherwise, other than the ones that are offered. I will never tell them any material information about the seller unless it's required by law or failure to disclose the information would constitute fraud or dishonest dealings. Any facts or suspicions regarding circumstances that could psychologically stigmatize the property. Colorado, we do not reveal stigma. Seller consents to broker's disclosure of seller's confidential information. to his supervising broker or designee for the purpose of supervision. What that comes down to is, although I'm gonna keep everything in confidence, if I have an employing broker, which you will, 
I would have to tell my employing broker anything they ask and I would go to them for advice. If I tell them it does not violate your confidentiality. The reason it doesn't is because technically the selling broker owns the contract. Therefore, it's not a problem for me to share with the selling broker any information. I also want you to know that we may have agreements with other sellers to market and sell their property. Broker may show alternative properties. I'm not promising you that I'm only selling your property and I'm only showing your property. I am not obligated to seek additional offers to purchase the property while the property is subject to a contract for sale. But remember, even though I'm not obligated to seek them, I am obligated to give them to you if they come my way. Broker has no duty to conduct an independent inspection of the property for benefit of buyer and has no duty to verify the accuracy or completeness of statement made by seller or their inspectors. No duty to conduct an independent investigation of the buyer's financial condition to verify the accuracy or completeness of any statement made by a buyer. Why is that important? What that simply means is I am allowed to take my seller at their word. I do not have to investigate to see if what they're telling me is true. So if I ask a seller, is the basement fully uh, permitted, maybe they put it in, and the seller says it is permitted, I do not have to go down to the county permit office or city permit office and check to see that it is permitted. I can take them at their word. Now, if I find out during the course of the sale that something they have told me is inaccurate, I would need to go back to my seller and say, hey, I've come across this information. Maybe your basement was not permitted or there is no record of it at the county. And the reason I know that is the buyer's agent or the buyer did check and they've informed me of that. So I would come back to them. I don't have to believe them once I know I have reason not to. But initially, I don't have any reason to try to investigate or prove them wrong. Seller understands seller is not liable for broker's acts or omissions that have not been approved, directed, and ratified by the seller. So it doesn't matter what I do, the seller is not responsible for things unless they have told me it's okay for me to do that. 5.8, when asked, the broker will disclose to prospective buyers and cooperating brokers the existence of offers on the property and whether the offers were obtained by the broker or a broker within the firm or another broker. You, the seller, have the choice of whether I will disclose that. Typically, I would prefer to disclose it, and the reason I would prefer to disclose it if I can is I can use that as leverage to try to get a better price for you by telling them things perhaps they didn't know. Additional duties of the seller's agent. If this box is checked, which in our case, remember it is, I have to promote the interests of the seller with good faith, loyalty, and fidelity. I have to seek a price and terms that are set forth in the seller's listing contract. I have to counsel you as to any material benefits and risk of a transaction that are known by the broker. Next part comes compensation to the brokerage firm. So how will the brokerage firm be compensated? Um, they're not going to test you on it because there's a million ways that can happen, uh, at least a million ways. So you should not see anything on this, but here's where it goes. If I said sales commission of 6% of the purchase price, that would be fine, pretty normal. And then if I was going to share that with a cooperating broker, in other words, if somebody brings me the buyer and they are a buyer's agent or a transaction broker, here's how much I will pay them. So typically, if I'm charging six, normally buyer's agents or transaction brokers receive about half, so 3%. So they'll get 3%, I'll get 3%. If I bring both, I could get 6%. Lease commission, we're not going to worry about. When you earn your commission. Any sale of the property within the listing period by seller, by broker, or by any other person. That's because I have an exclusive right to sell does not matter who sells it, I'm going to be paid. Broker finding a buyer who's ready, willing, and able to complete the sale or lease as specified in the contract. And then they go into any lease again. Now that's when I earn it. It's different from when you earn it to when you get paid. You earned it when you found the ready, willing, able person who will perform the contract as specified, but you will not be paid until such thing closes. So you get to when applicable and payable, the commission obligation applies to the sale made during the listing period, 
or any extension, the commission is payable at the time of closing of the sale. Now there's one exception to that. If there's no closing because the seller refuses to close, suppose we're under contract, I bring it all the way down the wire, we get to the closing table, and the seller refuses to close. If that happens, theoretically, I could sue my seller for my commission. Uh, but short of that, you're only gonna be paid if the property closes. The limits on third-party compensation, you remember RESPA. So I'm going to be telling people I am not being compensated by any third party. If I am, I'm gonna reveal what compensation I'm getting. If I have an affiliated business arrangement, Remember, an affiliated business range would be maybe we own the title company at Keller Williams. If, or maybe I as an agent own a title company. If I own more than 1% of any entity, I must disclose it in writing to you and everyone else. Other broker assistance, I'm gonna put this on the MLS, which is multiple listing services. Again, the property will or will not be submitted. I'm gonna tell you, or actually you're gonna tell me what I can do or I cannot do. If you want it on the internet, if you don't want it on the internet, those things are things you'll tell me. How we're gonna access the property. So we use electronic lock boxes in our business. Some people use manual, you check the box, explain it to your seller. Other than broker, who can get into this property? Right now, I'm probably gonna put it on the MLS and they're gonna set up appointments. And on those appointments, I'm going to actually say, it can be any active licensed real estate broker. So any active real estate broker. So they'll call in, they'll set up an appointment and they'll show the house. Pretty much how that's going to work. Um, unlicensed broker assistance, I asked the seller, will you allow that? Licensed appraisers, will you allow that? Unlicensed inspectors, all inspectors in Colorado are unlicensed. Therefore, if you wanna let an inspector in, just know they're unlicensed. We describe how we're going to market. You authorize videos and pictures of the interior and the property, except, and occasionally you'll have a seller say, I don't want pictures of my child's room or something like that. Marketing termination, it just is a disclosure telling them I own the pictures. Also telling them that if they're going to market the property in any way, shape or form, I get to know how they did it, I get to approve of it. The rest goes over negotiations, advertising. We get to line 208 on 10.3. I need you, the seller, to tell me that you are not currently party to another listing agreement. So we would check is not, that's the hope. If someone were to check they are, we would stop. At that point, I might be sign crossing because I know that they are under contract to someone else. So now I can ask them, hey, if you're under contract to somebody else and you are, I cannot help you. What I can do is I can write this listing agreement for a future listing. So if you'll tell me when that expires, maybe show me, I could write this contract to begin the day after your current agreement expires. Otherwise, I'm going to have to stop. If you were under contract to another agent, let's suppose you are on a contract to another agent, that agreement expired. I have to ask you the question, did they or have you or have you not received a list of prospects? Because if the other agent gave you a list of people they showed the house to, we'll show you, but they might be entitled to commission if that person buys the house for up to 60, 90 days, even six months. So I wanna know, did they provide you with a list of people they've already showed the house to? Again, I own the marketing. I'm gonna ask them if they're in foreclosure. If they are, there's some additional protections we're gonna give them. Then we come to price and terms. Again, questioning on this in the test would be not much. We have price, US dollars. How would you like it? Cash, conventional, FHA, VA, is there some other way? Are you willing to give discount points? Pay them for the buyer. Are you willing to pay buyer's closing costs? Usually not in this market. Earnest money, how much earnest money you want. So let's say you want $5,000, how do you want it? Usually we allow that as a personal check. 
because it's going to go to the title company anyway. When you close, how do you want to get paid? You want a cashier's check? You want funds electronically wired? Do you want a closing company trust account check? What would you like? Most people are going to choose those funds electronically wired to their bank account. FERPTA. FERPTA is Foreign Investments in Real Property Tax. All I need to know from you is if you are a foreign person who is not, is not a U.S. resident, and are you subject to foreign taxes? If you are, I need to know that. You'll check it here. If you don't check it, you're not. Colorado withholding, important piece. It's in the book. I think you've seen it. If not, you'll see it on the next uh, exam with Matt. In the Colorado withholding tax, if someone is an out-of-state seller and they are selling a property in the state of Colorado and they did not reside in that house for two of the last five years, the state of Colorado will withhold taxes upon closing and they will have to file with the state of Colorado a tax form to get their money back. Typically, that doesn't happen, but it can. Um, we can accept earnest money, is all the next one says. Inclusions, I'm going to ask you what you would like to include, what you would like to exclude, which things do you need in the house, So other inclusions down here, we have a conclusions not attached. You can read through those, but typically storm windows, doors, window ports, sh shades, awnings, blinds, screens, covering, treatment, curtain rods, drapery rods, fireplace inserts, fireplace screens, grates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are all considered inclusions. Personal property, if you wanna add more, other inclusions, maybe the stove, the refrigerator, washer, dryer, things of that nature. If you have any leased items, we'd like to know what they are. Some people have leased solar panels. We need to know about those. Trade fixtures and a residential sale. You shouldn't have any trade fixtures. We're not going to worry about that. Water rights. Typically, if we're in a city, we don't have water rights. We simply have a water tap. However, if we were in the country, we might have a deeded water right. If we have a deeded water right, we'll describe it here. Maybe it's ditch water. Um, other questions we can ask, do you have a well? If you have water rights, are you going to convey them at closing? Or are you going to keep them? Maybe you're going to keep the water rights. They're sold separately. If you have a well, I want to know the well permit number. If you have water stock certificates, we'd like to know those. If this is a rural property and you have growing crops, we need to know what those growing crops are. Because remember, growing <laughs> crops are considered implements. If they are not uh, perennial, they're annual crops, you would have the right to come back and harvest your crops unless we set up a bill of sale inside this contract. So conveyance. How do you want to convey your property? Now, if you're a seller, you probably would like me to check special warranty deed. If you're a buyer, you probably want general warranty deed. The weird thing is when the contract to buy or sell comes through, it'll be the buyer who selects how they want it. You, the seller, will have a right to disagree, but it will be the buyer who makes the initial response. Tenancies, if the property is currently leased or someone is living there, we might need to have the tenancy disclosed because maybe the person buying is going to be assuming the tenant. Association assessments here and here. Possession, how do you want to deliver it? So usually this is upon closing, but we might have a post-closing time where you get to keep the house a little longer. Material defects, disclosures and inspection. Again, we have broker's obligations that I have to disclose things. Then we come to the seller's obligation on 369, 18.2.1, seller's property disclosure form. Seller agrees or does not agree to provide a seller's property disclosure. 
I'll be showing you what the seller's property disclosure actually looks like. The seller is not obligated to fill out a seller's property disclosure. You as the broker are obligated to ask them to fill one out and to give it to them. Now, if they absolutely say, I'm not going to do it, they check does not agree. When they check does not agree, there are two things you need to tell them. One is that the buyer may insist. That's a test question. You need to tell them you said you won't do it. The buyer may insist on it or may choose not to buy the property. So you need to know that. The other thing is that whether you fill one out or not, if you have a material defect to the property, you absolutely must disclose it. Refusing to fill out a property disclosure does not relieve you of an obligation to disclose all material defects of which you have knowledge. Lead-based paint, we've gone over lead-based paint 100 times. We'll show you the form here in a bit. Um, carbon monoxide alarms, they have to be within 15 feet of the bedrooms condition of the property, basically just saying, hey, when you get a contract to buy this property, you're gonna turn it over to the seller in a substantially the exact condition it was in when the seller wrote the contract. Rights of the party to cancel. A lot of people think the seller can just walk away or that broker can walk away. Neither of those are true. Um, there are some ways to cancel, but somebody has to breach the contract. If in Colorado, virtually any time, if we go into disagreement, we're gonna to have to go to mediation. So if we have to go to mediation, mediation is almost always split cost between the parties, each one pays half. It's fairly unusual for us to be in it, but sometimes it happens more often with the property and the buyer. Non-discrimination, I need to tell you, I'm not allowed to discriminate. I have to follow all those rules. I recommend that you seek legal or tax counsel anytime you ask me a question that is out of the scope of my knowledge, such as if you ask, how should I deliver deed to the property? I can tell you what most often happens, however, I cannot make a recommendation. That would be a legal or tax person who would tell you that. Again, there's that mediation, attorney fees, additional provisions, not approved by the real estate commission, but we can put them in there. Uh, this contract's between me and the seller, not a problem. Come back down to electronic delivery. We're gonna fax it. Counterparts, entire agreement, copy of the contract. By signing, you acknowledge you are receiving a copy of the contract. Seller signs it, brokerage firm signs it. We are now under contract believe it or not, to buy this house or to sell your house, sorry. There you go. So good, long as I'm here. I'd like to ask you for a few other things as long as I'm here. So there are a few other forms, starting with a square footage disclosure. Might as well get them out of the way now. We have to disclose to the buyer how many square feet your house has. There's only one question on the test on this, so it's not a huge deal. But the question, I'll go over the form with you and tell you the question. I put the pop property address. It asked me whether I measured the house or not. Usually I'm gonna say I have not. I'm not an expert at measuring. Um, then listing licensee is or is not providing from this. This is where I would go. Typically, I go to the assessor's office. I get what they say is the square footage of your house. I click that box. I put the date that I checked it. I put the square footage over here. And that's what we're going to give to the buyer. Now, typically, those are wrong. However, it is a county record. And so wrong or right, I'm allowed to use it. I'm allowed to say it's there. Um, next, we're going to sign it. Seller's gonna sign it. And when we go into contract, the buyer's going to sign it. Here's the test question for you guys. Measurement may not be exact and is for purpose of marketing only. That's the test question. What is the purpose of the square footage disclosure? It is for marketing purposes only. 
marketing purposes only. All right. So as long as we're here um, and we're meeting, I'd rather not come back for three or four meetings to have you sign paperwork. Remember I said as the agent, you are responsible for giving the seller a seller's property disclosure. This is the seller's property disclosure. There's really only one test question over the seller. Well, there's two, excuse me. Um, one question is what happens if the seller refuses to fill it out? And the answer is I should tell them that the buyer may insist. Keeping in mind that they still must disclose any defects in the property of which they know about. Inside this property disclosure, are all kinds of nice things about the roof. These are simple yes and no questions. That's it. You don't have to know the end of the world to it. Um, either a person says, I know it, or they say, I don't. I know it, or I don't. But under H, you will see right here, H in your packet, might be a little out of order on these. I don't know why that got shuffled, but that's the way it is, you have them. This is the only other test question. Always in Colorado, we're concerned, always concerned about the source of water or water supply. Where does the house get its water? And we, they very stringent that we must tell the buyer how they're going to get water or if there's no water at all. So in the property disclosure under H, there is this source of water and water supply where we would put, if it's city, we just put the city, the website, the address, the phone number, that's our source of water. Pretty straightforward. If there are a well, we put well permit is or is not attached, we give the well number, et cetera. And if we do this, we will not need to do it twice. That's the test question. But I'm gonna show you where that comes up again. So this is source of water inside the disclosure. It's inside the property disclosure. That's all you really need to know. Don't care if you know all those other parts. Get signed by the seller. That's fine. The buyer will acknowledge having it. There you go. So if the house had a building permit that was issued prior to 1978, December 31, we are required in Colorado to use a lead-based paint disclosure. So if we have to use the lead-based paint disclosure, let's just assume this house was built in 1971 and it probably has lead-based paint. Again, multiple questions on the test show up right here under lead-based paint. So this is an attachment to the contract to buy and sell. Here's our street address and city. Here's our lead-based paint warning. Remember, this is kind of fun because you're going to get this three or four times on the test on lead-based paint. Remember, lead-based paint may pose a risk to children. Young children are most likely to be damaged. They may produce neurological damage, include learning disabilities, reduced intelligence quotient, behavioral problems, impaired memory. It also poses a particular risk to pregnant women. The seller is telling them these are known risks, not a problem. Seller's disclosure to buyer. So as long as we're here filling this out, Mr. Seller, here's how this works. If you have no knowledge of any lead-based paint in your house, you may check this box, seller has no knowledge. If you do have knowledge, you would check this box and write what knowledge you have. How do you know? Well, it could be that when you bought the house, somebody gave you a lead-based paint disclosure that said they knew it, or maybe you had the house tested. Whatever, if you have knowledge, you're going to tell the buyer what you know. Records, seller has no reports of records. You would check this box. If you do have such written reports, you would check this box. Buyer will acknowledge. Buyer has read the lead warning statement above and understands it. Buyer has received copies of this information in any records and reports listed by the seller. Buyer has received the pamphlet, protect your family from lead in your home. Now remember we said that's put out by Housing and Urban Development. It's a HUD pamphlet. 
if we send the buyer, if we send the buyer a link to HUD, their web page, where this is found, we have provided it. Uh, so buyer acknowledges under federal law that the seller has to give them 10 days with which to inspect the house should they choose to inspect the house. If at the end of the inspection period they find there is lead paint or some other thing is unsatisfactory to the buyer, the buyer can cancel the contract and get their earnest money back in all circumstances. But the buyer has a choice. So they could obtain a risk assessment, in which case they have their 10 days, or they can waive it. It's not atypical for buyers to waive it. A lot of times buyers understand lead-based paint. They know it's there. They know if you paint over it, you've sealed it. They know it's only if it's chipped and flaking, it's a problem. And so a lot of times the buyer just says, I'll waive it. Again, the seller is going to sign it, but this form's a little different in that the real estate listing agent is going to sign it. The buyer is going to sign it and the buyer's agent. By the way, the buyer's agent, weirdly, it's just set to confuse you, is referred to as the selling agent. When you see selling agent, that's different than seller's agent. I am the seller's agent. The selling agent is whoever brings the buyer. So all parties are going to sign this form. And... All right, remember in the uh, disclosures, there was a source of water disclosure. But remember that form is an optional form. So the seller might fill it out, the seller might not fill it out. If the seller fills it out and they fill out the source of water, we do not have to use this source of water addendum. We do not. One of the test questions is, do you have to use the source of water addendum if it's already found in the disclosure? And the answer will be no. No, you do not. So the source of water addendum, but because it's an optional form, maybe the seller didn't fill it out, then we do have this form. Again, it looks just like it does in the disclosure. We're telling the seller where they're gonna get their water, if there's a well, et cetera, et cetera. We sign it and date it and give it to them. So hooray, you're all done with your seller and you're ready to move on to the buyer. So you're sitting in your office, You've got the sign in the front yard, the house is listed with the MLS. You're looking for people to buy the house. You're doing your, your due diligence. You're calling people, telling them you have a house for sale. And lo and behold, in walks a buyer and says, hey, guess what? I'd like to buy a house. So for our purposes, I'll be your agent. You can be the buyer. And we're going to go through the exclusive lot right to buy. This will go a little faster because it's almost identical to the exclusive right to sell, just in reverse. So buyer's agency, transaction broker. Nope, I'm gonna start as a buyer's agent. Multi-person firm, again, I'm gonna tell you, I have a lot of agents in our firm and I am just one of them. I name the buyer. The brokerage firm is still my firm, Keller Williams First, broker is still me. Property. What would you like to buy? I can be pretty general here. You want to buy a single family residence or maybe a multifamily residence in Northern Colorado. That's fine. That's what I would put there. Again, they ask about leasing. We're not going to worry about leasing, but we do have a listing period, which just says, Hey, how long is this going to last? This is my exclusive right to buy. So remember, anytime you see the words exclusive, right? It means guess what? I have the exclusive right to purchase, help you purchase property. If you buy property without me, theoretically, I can sue you for my commission under all situations, but probably never gonna happen, but it's there. Okay, so again, listing period, contract begins. You say, well, I wanna start looking today. Great, we'll put today. I might say, well, the contract's gonna go six months. Well, here you go, contract's going six months through there. Again, brokerage relationship. We're going to talk about the same things we did with the seller, an in-company transaction with different brokers. Mainly, there's 100 plus agents. 
I may show you a house that one of our other brokers has listed. If that happens, that's an in-company transaction, different brokers. I will still be your buyer's agent. The other agent will be their seller's agent. Again, if they share information with their employing broker, it's not a problem. They are not violating your confidentiality or mine. Buyer's agent, unless broker's relationship with both. That just says, if I do show you my listing, I have a right to become a transaction broker. Again, just as with the seller, there's a box where I can say I don't have a right to become a transaction broker and I can only be a buyer's agent problematic. Um, I would never check it because it doesn't give me any options. I would hope that the buyer or the seller allows me to not check it, I should say. Brokerage duties. Again, this is going to look very similar. Seller, perform the terms, present offers, disclose material facts, advise buyer, account for monies, keep them fully informed. I'll never tell the seller that the buyer is willing to pay more than the purchase price. I'm not gonna tell them why they wanna buy. Any of so is exactly the same as the seller. Um, I'm not gonna seek out other properties for you if you're under contract. I don't have to inspect, same things. I must disclose to any prospective seller a material fact that is known by me, no matter how I come to know it. In particular with a buyer, what that would come to is Perhaps we're in the middle of the transaction and I find out that you have been turned down for the loan or you cannot complete the transaction financially, or I find out that you are not going to um, reside there even though the contract we submitted said you were. At any rate, it's all the same thing. I'm gonna promote the buyer's interest, seek their price, counsel them about benefits, Compensation, again, there won't be many questions about it. It can be happen a hundred ways to Sunday. Sometimes you'll actually tell the buyer, well, you don't pay me, the uh, homeowner who's selling the house is going to pay me. Sometimes you say, no, you're going to pay me even if the homeowner won't pay me, all of those things. So don't worry too much about it, but here's where we would spell it out. So who will pay the success firm, listing brokerage firm or seller may pay, but buyer is obligated. So if the selling agent won't pay me, you are obligated. Uh, a lot of people like to use this one, listing brokerage firm or seller may pay, buyer is not obligated. So I can let tell you, you will not have to pay me. Just like with the seller, we have a holdover period. All that says is that if I show you houses and this agreement expires, usually we put 90 days here. What it says is that if this expires and you go back and buy a house that I did show you and I introduced you to and worked on, you might owe me, if I put will, you might owe me for uh, the property. Again, limitation of third party compensation. I'm gonna ask the buyer again, are you or are you not under contract to another broker? Hopefully you say you are not. If you are, we're in the same boat, I can't sign cross. I need to ask you to stop and then I can write a future contract. Future contract meaning I can write it for when your other agreement expires. Rights of the parties to cancel. Again, everybody seems to think you can just cancel. You cannot. It's a little harder than you think. Disclosure of buyer's identity. That's a little different. Do you want me to disclose to the seller who you are? If you're John Elway, you might not want that. If you're just a normal person, you might not care. Uh, again, non-discrimination, recommendation of legal counsel, especially if you were to ask me, hey, Paul, how should I take possession of the property? Should I take it in severalty? How should I take it? Joint tenancy? I'm going to tell you that's a legal question and you should consult an attorney. Now, in the real world, it'll be a little different, but for the test, that's what you'll say. Again, we agree to do mediation. Everything's the same until we get down to here. Megan's Law on 259, line 259, if the presence of a registered sex offender is a matter of concern to the buyer, buyer understands the buyer must contact law enforcement officials to obtain the information. You will never obtain it for them. You have to be sure to tell the buyer if that's of concern to you, Call the local police, the local sheriff, go on the webpage, 
and find out the information. I don't tell you because if I do and you rely on me, I could be liable for it if it's wrong. If I simply direct you to the appropriate authority, they will be liable if it's wrong. By the way, they have governmental immunity, so there would be nothing you could do. Buyer signature address, again, if there's more than one buyer. Broker signature, once again, here. And we now have a buyer under contract. All right. So we have a buyer under contract, we have a seller under contract. The question becomes, what happens if our agreement expires? So remember I had a six month agreement to sell your house or maybe a six month agreement to help you buy a house. What happens if we're coming down to the end of that six months and that agreement is gonna expire? Well, assuming you still wanna work with me and I still wanna work with you, we might need to extend that contract. This listing contract amend extend, it is used to extend either the buyer's agreement or the seller's agreement. And in either case, it's going to extend it, but here's the trick of this contract and the test question. If our contract, if my exclusive right to buy or exclusive right to sell has already expired, I cannot use this form. I must rewrite it, a brand new one. Now, if it hasn't expired, then we can use this form. So if we're gonna use this form, we date it today's date. We say exclusive right to sell or exclusive right to lease or exclusive right to buy, <coughs> whichever one it is. And we have an agreement to amend, extend it. The date ending the listing period is changed to, pretty simple. Sometimes you wanna change the price. So on a seller's agreement, maybe I wanna change the price how much we're willing to sell the house for. Besides extending the contract, you may wanna change the price. So if we were agreeing to change a price, say you had initially listed the house for 500,000 and they wanna drop the price 20,000, they could agree to drop the price. But this is an amendment between you and your seller, you and your buyer. So again, they're gonna sign it you're gonna sign it and you're ready. This is an interesting form called the change of status. Remember then in the exclusive right to buy, exclusive right to sell, I told each of my clients, if I was selling them a property that I represented or bringing a buyer to a property I represented, I had the right to become a transaction broker. If that were to happen, this is the form we would use. So I would say regarding, this is the street address of the house. I would name the buyer. As agreed to between brokerage and undersigned the following contract, I might have exclusive right to sell and I might have an exclusive right to buy. Broker will be working as a transaction broker with both buyer and seller and will assist both parties. Receipt of this disclosure form is hereby acknowledged on. This is the date. I have the seller and the buyer. And then I put the date that I provided seller and buyer with a copy of this disclosure. So I'm basically disclosing to them, hey, here we are. We are looking at one of my listings. You wanna buy it. I'm going to change over to a transaction broker. This form, make sure that the buyer and seller both know that I've made that switch. This form is called a brokerage disclosure to buyer and a definition of working relationships. Well, what if I'm working in an open house? It's my listing. I'm sitting there, people are coming in, they're looking at the house and somebody comes in and starts to engage me in conversation or I engage them and I start to find confidential information out about them. I would need to tell that person who I work for, namely, I work for the seller in this case. Now, if I was working with a buyer and I was going around and I was actually looking at for sale by owners, I might have to tell the for sale by owner, I work as a buyer's agent. This form tells them what those are. A customer is right here. 
that would be what the person who's asking me questions about the house is at the open house. So I need to be sure and use this form to tell that buyer, potential buyer, I work for the seller, and that way they understand they are nothing but a customer. I would fill out this form, I'm a multi-person firm. I would tell, check one box only, broker is, am I a seller's agent, etc. Once I fill this out, I give it to the buyer and they acknowledge receiving it. So thinking I'm at an open house and I'm having to disclose to the people coming into the open house that I am the agent who works for the seller, I'm gonna have these forms available. Now I don't have to get everyone to sign them. If they just ask questions about the home, I'm okay. If I start engaging them in conversation where I'm trying to solicit from them private personal information, that I can use to help my seller, I have to give them this form. Now, the problem is they're not my client. They're just someone who walked in. What happened if they refuse to sign it? Well, we have a way around it. Broker acknowledgement. On, I would date it. Broker provided, I give the name of that buyer. This document via, maybe I emailed it to them or I handed it to them, whatever, and retained a copy from my records and then signed it. Even if they didn't sign it, that would be proof that I did in fact present it, I did in fact disclose to them that I work for this seller. If I were out with my buyer and I ran into a for sale by owner, I've got the same problem. I represent the buyer. I want to make sure the for sale by owner understands I don't represent them and I will be treating them as a customer. This is the form I would use in that case. Broker's disclosure to seller for sale by owner. Same thing in reverse. I'm just telling them, hey, guess what? I work for the buyer. Then we come to the biggie. The contract to buy and sell real estate. It's the heart of everything we do. Most Everything we do and most everything on the test is contained inside the contract to buy and sell. Most important document that we fill out. What allows us to fill it out? The state Supreme Court. They said so in Conway versus Bogue that as long as we're filling out a real estate approved form and we are just filling in the blanks, we are not acting as attorneys. That's Conway Bogue. So we're ready. We've got a buyer. Our buyer is ready to put an offer in on the house. We pull out the contract to buy and sell real estate. Remember, this would be the buyer who's filling this out, not the seller. First thing we do is date it. That date is today's date. That's all it is. Parties, buyer, name. Again, we ask our buyer, how will you be taking possession of the property. And if they were to ask, well, how should I joint tenant, tenants in common or other, we would say you should contact an attorney. That's a legal question. The seller, the name of the seller, we'll know that it's in the MLS. The property, we need the legal description and then we need the street description of that property. Inclusions, again, normally you're gonna look at what's on the MLS, what they're willing to include, but the buyer always has the option to ask for something else. So let's suppose the seller, when they were working with their agent, told the agent, we are not leaving the kitchen stove. And they put that in the exclusive right to sell. But when the buyer and their agent wrote this, they put down other inclusions, the stove. We want the stove. And then let's suppose that the seller got anxious to get this contract, didn't really read it very thoroughly, signed it and agreed to it, and then later said, hey, we're not giving up the stove. We told our agent we're not giving up the stove. It's too bad. What's in this contract would overrule the other because the buyer had no way of knowing what you told your agent, but they do know what you agreed to in this contract. So if that were to happen, this contract will rule. In real world, 
buyer's or seller's agent will be buying a new stove. We have parking and storage facilities. Again, they're gonna ask about water rights because remember how important those are in Colorado. Again, they're gonna ask about well rights, water stock certificates, all of that here. Then we come to deadlines and dates. This is where the rubber hits the road. The most important part. If you're not going to submit earnest money with the contract, you could say, I'll do it three days after we come to agreement. That's what's called an alternative earnest money deadline. Otherwise, it should be submitted with the contract. But oddly in Colorado, earnest money is not required for a contract to be valid. We could just not agree. We're just not giving you any earnest money. And we would still have a valid contract if the other side accepted. We come to several dates and deadlines, record title deadline, objection deadline, off title and off title deadline. Remember title company, if you remember from the yellow book, is gonna provide the buyer with some information about the title. The buyer's got an opportunity to look at what there is and either object or accept. Won't be on the test, so not a big deal. Um, owners Association, if we have an HOA, we'd like to know when you're gonna give us the documents and we have a deadline. Again, with that deadline, the buyer could look at it and say, you know, I don't like the HOA. They won't allow dogs over two foot tall. Therefore, I'm out, and they could withdraw. That's what these deadlines mean. Association document deadline and a termination deadline. If I don't agree with what I see in the HOA docs, I, the buyer, can walk away and get my earnest money back. Your property disclosure deadline, remember, going back there, if you didn't give me one, I could insist on one here. Lead-based paint disclosure, I want that form by this date. Loans and credit, here's where the buyer's saying, I will make a loan application by this date. But I have a termination deadline, a new loan termination deadline. What is that? Well, if I'm offered a loan and I don't like the loan that I end up being offered, I can terminate and get my earnest money back. Um, this isn't a big deal. It's if the, you were actually carrying the loan yourself. We're not gonna worry about it. Appraisal deadline. I will have the property appraised by a certain date. Appraisal objection deadline. If I, appraisal comes back and it doesn't come in at a price, say I offered you 500, comes in at 480, I, the buyer, have a resolution deadline that may be three days longer. We could negotiate. What are we gonna do? This came in at 480, I offered 500 we could resolve or not resolve. If we don't resolve, again, the buyer could terminate the contract and get their earnest money back. Survey, if I agree to do a survey, I have a deadline, I have a time again where I can look at the survey, and if there's a problem with the survey, we can try to resolve it. If we can't resolve it, I, the buyer, can cancel the contract, get my earnest money back. Inspection, this will be on the test. I have an inspection objection deadline. So I have usually, typically, 10 days with which to inspect the house. After I inspect the house, I can make an inspection objection. So by this time, I have to give you an objection. Hey, there's a problem with the roof, problem with the sewer, windows are broke, whatever it is. I give you the objection by the deadline date. On this resolution date, usually three days later, so let's just say this was June 1, this one might be June 4th, that gives us three days to negotiate my objection and us to come to resolution. If we don't come to resolution, the contract terminates automatically. If we go past that inspection resolution deadline and we do not resolve it, the contract will terminate automatically and the buyer will get their earnest money back. Property insurance termination. 
I have a period of time, whatever day, maybe I put June 1st there. So I have up until June 1st to make sure that I can get insurance on the property that's suitable to me. If I don't, I may terminate and get my money back. Due diligence document delivery deadline. I can ask for you to give me any documents in your possession, um, maybe warranties, roof warranties, et cetera. Again, if I review them, I could object to them. We could come to a resolution deadline. Again, if I can't get it resolved, I can terminate, get my money back. Conditional sale deadline, right here, big one. Let's suppose I'm the buyer and I have a house that I must sell in order to buy your house. I would put conditional sale deadline. So let's say I was trying to buy your house and close it by the end of June. I might put, I have until the third week of June to sell my house and close it. If I do not sell my house and close it, I have the right to cancel the contract and get my earnest money back. Lead-based paint termination, remember that's 10 days from whatever day we agree that you would give it to me. They want to know the closing date, the date will close, what day will you give me possession, what time. And then on this offer, I'm going to give you an acceptance deadline. So you, the seller, here's your acceptance deadline. I've made the offer. Usually I'll give you 24 or more hours, sometimes a little longer. And you can either accept my offer or you can reject it, or you can do nothing. If you do nothing and the acceptance deadline comes and goes, and the time comes and goes, the offer is terminated. You can't come back to me if I tell you I need to hear from you in 24 hours. You can't come back to me three days later and say we accepted your offer. No, you have to get it within the acceptance deadlines. Strangest thing, if FHA and VA loan boxes are checked, the appraisal deadlines do not apply. So weird, FHA and VA used to be really hard to get an appraisal. It took them a lot longer to do it. And so they are exempt from the deadline to do the appraisal. Basically, if theirs doesn't come back in value, it doesn't matter what deadline you put on there, the buyer may cancel and get their money back. Purchase price and terms, not really on the test, but here's where I'd tell you I'm going to pay $500,000. i am putting $5,000 down. Um, or earnest money, sorry. I'm giving you $5,000 earnest money. I'm taking a loan of $400,000. And I'm bringing another ninety five dollars cash to close. They all total $500,000. That's what you're being offered. I might ask you to give me some concessions. How about you pay for points. How about you pay some of my FHA or VA loan points, etc. I put that here. Earnest money is the form of, I'm going to put probably a personal check payable to, remember we use third parties to hold our earnest money, usually a title company. They're listed here, land title for instance. Um, then we come down here, it says time of payment and availability of funds. I'm going to check does or does not have funds that are immediately verifiable. A lot of times you're going to say I don't, but I have them. I just don't have them immediately verifiable. Loan limitations. Buyer may purchase the property using any of the following types of loans. I could check one. I could check several. Conventional FHA, VA, any of them. Or other, I could just say no loan, cash. Here we have assumption if I were taking over your loan, uh, they don't test it and probably won't because it's so rare. Seller or private financing, sometimes a seller will offer to carrier. Again, it's rare, so probably won't see anything on a test regarding that. Most of this, then we get down to appraisal and everything else, just goes over those dates and deadlines. So if you were looking at those dates and deadlines, they referred to a paragraph. Here's the paragraphs they were referring to. So you could look at a date and deadline, come read these if you like, but I kind of went over each one of those dates and deadlines. This all right here, title insurance. So seller typically selects the title company and that's normal for the seller to select. 
but the buyer has an option to select the title company. If the buyer elects to choose the title company, the buyer is going to have to pay for the title insurance. And that's about 1500 bucks. Normally buyers don't wanna pay that, so they let the seller select. Owner extended coverage on title commitment. Usually you'll just check will. Don't worry about it. You can go back to yellow book if you need, look up title. Um, you negotiate how you're gonna pay for the closing costs. Usually it's one half buyer, one half seller, but it is negotiable. And then we get to abstracts of title, off record title. It's just descriptions of everything in those title. We come down here to line 398, oil, gas, water, mineral disclosure. We sell surface estates. We do not sell mineral rights. And those are typically very detailed and you're probably gonna have to go to an attorney to get it done. New ILC. So remember what an ILC is, improvement location certificate or a survey. Buyer decides, do I want an ILC, a new one? And do I want a survey? If they do, they check it. They check who they think should order such a thing and who they think should pay for such a thing. Normally, if you're gonna want a survey, the buyer's gonna pay it, but you can ask the seller to pay it. These again are inspection objection, referring back to those dates and deadlines, due diligence, docs, conditions, lead-based paint, et cetera. Then we get to closing provisions. Title company is gonna to wanna to know how you wanna close the property. So again, the closing documents are here. We would be telling them how we're going to do it. We want, remember I told you before, the buyer's going to choose the type of deed buyers should probably want a general warranty D and they're gonna check that box. Now again, in your exclusive right to sell, you might've said, well, I'm only giving a special warranty deed, but whatever gets agreed to on this form is what's going to be agreed to. Closing costs and fees, they're all negotiable. Maybe we're gonna pay half buyer, half seller. If we have a status letter, record change fees by HOA, et cetera, we can negotiate who water transfer fees, all those kind of things again. Here's that FERPTA again. Just everybody has to disclose that they're a foreign person. Here's that Colorado withholding part again. If the seller is an out-of-state seller and they did not live in the house two of the last five years, they may have some portion of their sale withheld. Prorations, remember we'll talk about prorations when we get to closing with Matt on Wednesday but we typically check most recent mill levy so they know how to go back. Rents, if the house has someone living in it, how are we gonna prorate rent? Let's suppose we're closing on July 15. Well, then the seller probably already collected. So are we, is he gonna pay us based on rents received or rents accrued? Just for fun, I always check rents accrued, it's not on the test. Other prorations, maybe water, sewer, things like that. Possession, if seller fails to deliver, how much does the buyer want to be paid per day for every day? Make that a big number, $400. Don't make it worth the buyer and seller staying in the house. Sometimes, and this box here, is, we'll get to it in a second, sometimes the seller's gonna stay in the house for 30 to 60 days after closing, and the buyer's gonna lease it to them for a couple months. If that's true, you might check this box saying buyer and seller agreed to execute a post-closing occupancy agreement. That's nothing more than a lease. I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, let's see. Remember we talked in the yellow book that on the day of closing, the buyer's allowed to do a walkthrough verification of condition. So the day before closing or the day of, the buyer, upon reasonable notice, has a right to walk through the property prior to closing and verify the physical condition of the property and its inclusions. It is not an opportunity to reinspect the home. It is only an opportunity to make sure that you are getting the inclusions you were told and that it's being left in substantially the same condition that you purchased it in. Recommendation of legal and tax, same thing. If buyer is in default, 
if buyer is in default? What happens if the buyer breaches the contract? So if we check this box specific performance, that means we could sue the buyer and force them to buy the house. Now remember who's filling out this form? The person filling out the form is the buyer. I don't think it's highly likely the buyer is gonna risk that much. Maybe in a commercial deal, but not in residential. So if no box is checked, which is normal, it is liquidated damages. What is liquidated damages? If the buyer were in default, the seller gets to keep the earnest money. Now, if you go back to when I was going over those dates and times, and every time I said, at this point, the buyer may cancel the contract, get their money back, you should have noticed that that was happening with regularity. A buyer has about 50 ways to get out of a contract. A seller has none. Sellers are always held to specific, specific performance. Buyers are normally only held to liquidated damages, and they have 50 different options to walk away. Sometimes you might wonder why we even have earnest money in Colorado. It's very rare, actually, for someone to get the earnest money. So if the seller's in default, the buyer may elect to treat the contract as canceled, in which case all earnest money received here under will be returned to buyer. Alternatively, buyer may elect to treat the contract as being enforced and affect the buyer has the right to specific performance, damages, or both. So the buyer could sue the seller and say, no, you have to sell the house. Mediation. Multiple tests, questions on mediation and earnest money dispute in particular. And mediation is most often gone to over earnest money. So again, if we get into a disagreement between buyer and seller, they're required to go to mediation before going to court. They're required to split the cost of the mediation, but they don't have to agree. They could go on to court after mediation. But in an earnest money dispute, which is normally what the problem is, the seller doesn't want to give the earnest money back, the buyer wants the earnest money back. Um, there are several test questions right here. In the event of any controversy regarding the earnest money, earnest money holder is not required to release earnest money. Earnest money holder is sole subject discretion has several options. One, they could wait for any proceedings between buyer and seller. So what does that mean? Well, if the buyer and seller can't agree what's to happen, the title company might say, we'll wait and you guys go to mediation. And if you agree in mediation and you send us how you agreed in mediation, we'll do what the mediator and you guys agreed to. It's one thing they could do. They could interplead all parties and deposit the money in a court of competent jurisdiction. So let's suppose you go to mediation and you guys can't agree. Now one of you files a lawsuit. Well, then the title company will take the money. They will go over to the county clerk and they will, courts clerk, and they will say, hey, here's the earnest money. Give it to the judge. They can do their lawsuit. When the judge is done, they can hand over the money to whoever they say wins. Three, we might provide notice to buyer and seller that unless the earnest money holder receives a copy of a summons and complaint, that's a court case, or a claim containing a case number of the lawsuit within 120 days. 120 days is the key. If they don't receive something within 120 days, they are going to return the earnest money to the buyer. Period. About four ways to end that. So we talk about notice of choice of law, acceptance, good faith, big deal on good faith. Buyer and seller acknowledge that each party has an obligation to act in good faith. Why is that important? Because if you end up in front of a judge and the judge feels like you're the one not acting in good faith, they could award it to the other person based on that alone. Additional provisions, not going to worry about. Uh, don't need to worry about that. So here's our contract. Buyer signs it. Buyer's name, buyer's signature. If there's more than one buyer, husband, wife, perhaps. The seller obviously isn't going to sign it yet because we're sending it over to the seller. 
So we're done with our contract, working with the buyer. We send it to the seller's agent. The seller's agent is going to go over this contract with the seller. Maybe they have multiple offers, more than one. They're going to point out the risk and benefits. They're going to go through each contract offer. Let's suppose the seller says, okay, we want to accept it. If they want to accept it and they're within the deadlines, they will sign accepting the contract. If they want to counter it, let's just say there's something there that they don't like and they want to have changed. We do a thing called counter. If that happens, they do not sign the contract. Signing this contract is acceptance. Once you've signed it, you've accepted. So if you're going to try to do an amendment or some kind of counter proposal, we're not going to sign it. Then we have broker's acknowledgement. Broker does or does not acknowledge receiving the earnest money. Usually you do not. You're going to have an alternative earnest money deadline. But if the, if the buyer gave you the money, you could say, yes, I have it. Broker is working with the buyer how? Well, in this case, I'm the buyer's agent. Maybe it's a change of status if you're doing your own transaction. I put my brokerage firm, license number, address, phone, everything else. Then we have compensation. Why is this important? Broker does or does not acknowledge receipt of earnest money. Broker agrees that if brokerage firm is the earnest money holder, da -da -da, who's holding it? And then we agree that we'll help get the money back from the title company if we need to. The selling agent might say, well, I'm working as the seller's agent. And we're all signed, assuming that they signed and accepted. But what if they didn't sign and accept? What if they did not sign and accept? We come to the counter proposal. So now the seller is going to tell the buyer, we like your offer, but there's something we like, we'd like. we like to be different. Normally, that's going to be money. Nine times out of 10, I was asking 500 for the house. You offered me 480. Um, I want 490. I'm going to split the difference. If that's the case, they issue what's called a counter proposal. The counter proposal, we just put a date. Here, we talk about the contract, where this date was, who the seller and buyer are, what the property address is. And then here's the changes we would like to see in the contract to buy and sell. It could be dates and times, any of these. It could simply be money. That's what it normally is. I'd have to say more often than not, that's what it is. And then we send it back to the buyer with an acceptance deadline of maybe 24 hours saying, hey, we'll give you 24 hours to accept these changes. If the buyer wants to accept them, the buyer will then sign and we're under contract. The buyer might not accept them. Let's say it's 480 and they wanted 500 and these people came back with 490. The buyer could issue another counter proposal saying, no, we'll give you 485. That can go on multiple times. The important thing to know about a counter proposal is a counter proposal is a rejection of the original offer. If you, the seller, send the buyer a counterproposal and they don't respond to you within this time, you can't then go back and say, oh, never mind, we'll accept your original offer. No, once you issue the counter, you have rejected the offer. So let's just assume that they did and they signed it, everybody's all happy and everybody's saying, yay, this is great. We all intend to go forward with this. So that's where we're at. Okay. The other thing we might want to put out now is closing instructions. These instructions are not required, so you're not going to see them on the test in any detail. Uh, but if we were trying to make sure that the closing company was committed and was going to do what we need them to do, we send these instructions to the closing company. Everybody has to sign them, including the title company, and agree how we're going to do things. It just talks about proration, who's going to prepare the deeds things of that nature. Again, you're not going to see it on the test, but the buyer is going to sign it, seller is going to sign it, and somebody from the closing company is going to sign it. Just saying, okay, we got it, here's what we're doing. 
again, I told you before, maybe the seller is going to stay in the house for 60 days, in which case they execute this post-closing occupancy agreement. Not a big deal. It's just a rent back agreement. Pretty straightforward. You can look it over. It can only go for 60 days. If they want to go more than 60 days, they need to get a lawyer and have a lease written. That's it. But what happens if we're in the middle of the contract now and somewhere in the contract, we need to amend or extend a date or change something. We don't want to have to rewrite the entire contract. So just like we had an amend, extend the listing agreement, this is an amend, extend the contract. In it, we can name everything and we can say, Hey, we may, maybe we just need uh, another week to get the appraisal done. So we're going to change the appraisal date or maybe we need a little longer to get a survey done or an inspection objection, those kind of things. Any changes to the contract are made on this form. The only test question is what form do you use if you need to make a change to the contract? Use an agreement to amend, extend the contract. That's it. What form do you use to amend or extend the listing agreement? Agreement to amend, extend the listing agreement. There's only two agreements to amend, extend. Next, what happens if somehow we miss a date and deadline? So let's say we miss the inspection objection deadline. Remember I told you, if you get to the inspection objection deadline and then to the resolution and you have not resolved it on the resolution deadline, the contract terminates. Well, what if that happened by accident? The real estate commission just created a form that said, oops, we agreed to revive the contract. We made a mistake. So they gave us this form just saying, well, we really intended to keep going. We just missed a deadline. If everybody signs it, the contract's in full force. No big deal. So now the buyer has a chance to inspect the property. They inspect it. If they see something they don't like about the property, they have a right to object. You remember that objection deadline. This is the form they would use. They inspect the property. They use this form. They tell the seller what they want the seller to do. I would like you to repair the roof. I would like you to repair the gutters, whatever it is. They send it over to the seller. Now you'll notice right here, there's a withdrawal right here. You don't sign that, but it's there because if at some point the buyer decides to withdraw this objection, they can. They can just say, oh, never mind. We'll just withdraw the objection. I'll show you how that comes up. So it goes over, and now the seller's looking at the inspection objection. They come up with a resolution. Typically, they say, hey, here's the things we're willing to do. You asked for the roof and the gutters and the sewer. We're willing to do the roof and the gutters. We're not going to do the sewer, whatever. They put what they're willing to do. If the buyer and seller both agree on what to do, then the buyer signs it, the seller signs it, and we're in business. We have a resolution. Everything's good to go. <coughs> so now the seller will do whatever repairs they said they'll do and we're ready to go. But what if the seller said, I'm not gonna do anything, and the buyer still wanted to buy the house? Well, then the buyer could come back to the withdrawal of the objection, they could withdraw it, and they could still buy the house. But if they wait until the inspection resolution deadline, if you go over that deadline, the contract automatically terminates. Appraised value objection, same thing. We get the appraisal back, and maybe there's something on the appraisal that we can object to, normally it's price. We send the objection notice and we have a time to resolve that and try to figure out what we're gonna do there. You know, the buyer always could bring more money to closing. <laughs> if it didn't appraise for enough, one of the things that can happen is that the buyer just brings more money to closing. We have a bill of sale they wanna ask you about. Notice to terminate. If the buyer for some one of those hundred reasons decides it's time to terminate, they would send this notice to the seller along with their reason for termination. Well, my new loan didn't come in. 
I didn't get the appraisal I needed. Um, I don't like the inspection. There's all these reasons they could terminate. Notice how many ways the buyer can terminate, how many ways the seller can terminate. Seller has very few. Um, assuming they're not financing, that's out. Credit information's out if they're not. Liabilities out if they're not. Short sale addendum. One way they might get out, but that's about it. We terminate. If everyone agrees, we do an earnest money release. We send this over to the title company. Won't be on the test. And we get our earnest money back. This form is called the licensee buyout addendum for the contract to buy and sell real estate. A couple of questions on the test about it. This form is only used when an agent wants to buy their list. So let's suppose I list your house and then I decide I want to buy your house. Or when I'm listing your house, I tell you if the house doesn't sell in 60 days, I'll buy the house. Either way, I'm buying my own listing. If that's the case, I must use the buyout addendum. Now, if I'm just an agent buying a house, I don't have to use this. It has to be a listing I have that I'm buying. If so, I fill out this form. No big deal. The key for the test, the only question is, do I need to use it if I'm just buying a house? No. When do I use it? Only when buying my own listing. That's it. This is a contract to buy and sell real estate with a foreclosure protection. This is the same contract, but it has a paragraph or two added to it. And why that's there is, remember in the other contract, the seller had no way out? Well, if the seller were under threat of foreclosure and the buyer was attempting to buy the house, the seller under foreclosure has an out. So suppose they're going to foreclose on my house and you offer me 400000 for it. It's worth six hundred, And my parents come along and say, hey, you know what? We don't want you to sell your house. We'll pay off the foreclosure. I could pay off the foreclosure and cancel my contract with you. It protects people who are under threat of foreclosure. If they're under threat of foreclosure, they have the right to cancel the contract at any time up until the day of closing. That's called the Foreclosure Protection Act. I'm not going to go through the whole contract. Really, all you need to know is if you're under threat of foreclosure, you do the seller does have another way out of the contract that they would not normally have. And that is pretty much it. Um, it's a pretty detailed look. If you look in your book under contracts and you go to the questions at the back, you'll find the questions. You need to make sure you can answer those in your Colorado Compass. If you have questions, you should review this video again. A lot of questions on the test come right off this video. So I would watch this video at least a couple of times. At least a couple of times. Again, if you have questions, please be sure to call Matt or myself. And good luck on the test.